because I remember the next day I was already telling them, can I be discharged, please? And they're like, you've not even seen a psychiatrist. Oh, you don't love yourself. You need to love yourself. And I'm like, gee, thanks. I'm tired. Like, I was so tired, but I can't master sleep. Hello there. My name is Oidera Wangui. This is going to be a candid. I've not done one of these. I've actually never done one of these. I mean, I've been on camera most of my videos. I don't show my face or I don't talk. It's usually my point of view anyway, <laughs> but I digress. Today I'm going to be talking about my depression journey, how far I've come, how it all started, the journey, how dark it got, and I'm now here. Yeah, so <sighs> I was really a few days back. I remember feeling really sad that I'm not where I am at in life. I'm almost turning 30. I think, okay, in a year's time, but I have a habit of <laughs> giving myself my next age. Um, so I'm almost turning 30, and of course that usually comes with pressure. There's the usual pressure of getting a kid, getting married. Those don't face me. Um, what faces me is goals I had set for myself. I was planning to be, to retire at 35, and I am very, very far from that financially career wise i'm very far from that sorry i have a cough but then i remembered how far i've come the battles i've had to fight i've literally had to fight for my life to get here and now i no longer battle with that and that's a win that's a win in my books trust me it is a win so how did it all start i think i got into depression somewhere around September in 2023. That's when it started. It started gently. It doesn't hit you immediately. It was gentle, casual, and I was like, maybe I'm exaggerating. Maybe I'm, you know, you're told, you also don't want to talk about it because you're told you're seeking attention. So I didn't talk about it at all. What I did was just lay around in bed and rot. <laughs> I wasn't working. Then in October, an event occurred. There's an event that occurred in August, July, and it didn't. It impacted me, and that's when my depression started kicking in. But then in October, one night something happened that made it even worse, and that was the beginning of hell for me. Um. I say it's beginning of hell because I had started getting better. I had started sleeping better. At least I think so. But I remember the sleepless nights had started somewhere in September. Uh, and I remember the first time I couldn't sleep. I had a casual com I had a conversation with a friend and they said something during the conversation which to them was just funny. And to me... It really stung, and this is not a case of oh someone has wrote to me, so I was just I don't know. Um, and if they knew the impact of what they were saying, they couldn't have said it to me. So it's not that it's ill intentions at the end. I know that um, they were a friend to me, but regardless, that was the first night I couldn't sleep. Um, I was alone for the first time in five years I had started living alone and it was a lot I would struggle with my dog I would I, at least I kept the routine I would take her for walks in the morning and then the whole day spend it in bed I would let her stay in the bedroom with me but I wasn't playing with her I wasn't around with her as much and it started to affect her, our relationship. So it was bad, it was bad. And I was alone for the first time. It really, it really sucked. Don't get me wrong, I have no issue of being alone. Um, but this time, it really, really impacted me because of the events that led to this in the first place. They were really, really, really for lack of a better word, tumultuous, 
to me. Um, so yeah, I was living alone with my dog. I start work and uh, I, at this time, I think that's when I had started becoming a high functioning depressed person. I would go to work, work normal, come back home, not sleep. <laughs> like I would sleep for only two hours a night and that was normal. And that had started back in June, but for different reasons. <laughs> I'll talk about it in a different video. And then I would go to work and it's not a remote job. I'm having to show up physically with no sleep. <laughs> and it's your first three months at a job and you have to prove yourself because of the, of the whole probation thing. So somehow I managed. I finished the three months. Um, at some point, it gets really hard. I remember it's only one person who knew I was suicidal at this point, and I don't think they also knew how bad it was for them, for me. I remember the first time I called my sister. I couldn't sleep. It was 12 uh, at night, and I call her, and I'm like, all this has happened. I've not let you in on it, and I'm now really, really suicidal. And she's really shocked. She calls my mom. And my mom texts me. Of course, a verse from the Bible or something. And that's when I call her. I just needed peace. And I talked to her and I was able to sleep for a few hours. Maybe two. That was my norm. So I sleep. And then, of course, I wake up. I was ruminating a lot. That's what kept me up at night. I was trying to edit my past and I couldn't and I didn't understand the actions I had taken. I didn't understand myself. You know, you're like, yeah, just forgive yourself. But you're like, forgive God. I don't understand why you did that in the first place. Um, so I really struggled with that. I came to understand it later. I had a psychotic episode and I did all these events when I was unconscious and they didn't make sense to me when I gain consciousness because now you're dealing with your reality and it's a lot to take in um, and that was a lot for me and again I was dealing with it alone um, so yeah I call my mom we talk, I sleep and then I go the next day I think that's when I try to buy sleeping pills for the first time because I was really struggling to sleep. I'm tired, like I was so tired, but I can't master sleep. I tried everything, I tried meditation, and every time you try meditation, your mind is like, hmm, do you even deserve peace? You're a bad person. <laughs> yeah, it's really hard not liking yourself. So, yeah, I decided I don't even deserve that peace. And it worked for a while, but then it didn't work. So I go to a pharmacist and try to get sleeping pills, and they tell me they can't give me that. So they gave me Panadol night. Um, so that helped, like, make me less tired. I was still ruminating, but it wasn't as intense. Um, so I slept. I'm still ruminating, like, you'd find me like this every time like this i'm at work and it's like my skin is crawling it's like i'm burning up it's like things are crawling on my skin that's what i would spend the whole night doing i'm trying to edit my past but it's not editable don't get me wrong i didn't kill someone or anything <laughs> but it was really really hard so what i did was get that for the night i was able to sleep for the first time in a long time i was still ruminating but I was able to sleep and I go to work. The next day I buy more because I needed to sleep but this time they don't work and then I think my mom comes into Nairobi. Um, I go to my sister's, we were to converge there and they, they sandwiched me. <laughs> like I was in the middle between my sister and my mom and I slept throughout that night um, and then the next morning, my mom asked me what happened. So I explained everything. It doesn't make sense to her, of course. It wasn't making sense to me either. She's like, but you brought this on yourself. <laughs> and now you're suicidal. <laughs> um, 
a whole different story. Yeah, so she doesn't understand it. She's like, am I? She was wondering, am I bewitched? Was I bewitched by someone? <laughs> it was so empty pattern for me. Um, she just didn't comprehend her daughter um, had gone through all that and allowed all that to happen. Anyway, she leaves because she has to go back to work to her normal life. She leaves and then I move to my sister's place. I start staying at my sister's place. I leave, uh, at this time I was staying with my dog. So I have to take, I take my dog to daycare, to boarding school. And then I go and stay with my sister. I just left my house. I couldn't stay there anymore. Um, and I thought I would find peace there. Uh, but then the anxiety was still a lot like, the anxiety was so bad I would feel like as if someone is ringing my intestines. I like for instance cooking is something I've always loved but I only started cooking in June, June 2024. I couldn't cook. Every time I tried to cook I was just, I don't know why cooking was the highlight for me. Maybe I couldn't do many other things but Cooking was the one that stood out for me. Um, I actually couldn't do many things. I would just work, come back home, watch, sleep. And that sleep is sleep. Question mark, sleep. Like I would even try to go to bed early or try to listen to sleeping music. Nothing is working. Nothing was working. My sister was of course struggling because she's trying to support me so I sleep. Like, should sleep, wake up at four, I've been up there all night. So, the good thing is I got a lot of work done. <laughs> like, in that period, people thought I was just producing more work, but the reality is I couldn't sleep, so I guess work. Um, so, yeah, you're there committing code at 12 a.m., 4 a.m., and then you, you are at work early because... It's your normal work day. You have to continue. So I go continue working. Um, that was really, really high stressful for me. I remember this that day I stayed up the whole night, as usual. And my sister woke up and she was angry at me. She's trying to get me to sleep. She literally hugged me like a baby. And in that moment, I remember feeling some peace of. You know the worst person in the world and my man rested and slept for 34 minutes <laughs> I could rest and I rested and she tried that the next day and it didn't work it's like we we'll try one thing for the first time it works and then it won't be reproducible anyway I go to work, continue work, life as normal. I'm very, very suicidal. At that point, I didn't think being suicidal is depression. I just thought they were two separate things. I thought depression was sadness, you know? But I was severely depressed. And I just couldn't put my mind off. Like, I'm at work and I'm like, please. Like, you'd think I have a skin infection, but I didn't have a skin infection. Um, my skin changed, I look older, uh, I lost a lot of weight. So, flash forward, we move, we move in with my sister, like we get a house together. And bear in mind, I'm not able to cook, so I've not cooked, I've never ever cooked in this house when we live together. I tried. I remember this time psyched, I go to the market and I even call my mom and I'm like, today I'm cooking. <laughs> I don't know what someone told me. Like, the problem with depression is you go from zero to a hundred real quick. Just one thing needs to trigger you and you just put down everything you've done. Um, so I didn't cook that day. I ended up stressing. My friend sent me some articles on depression which helped a bit and that weekend I end up in hospital but that's flash forward let's come back we start living with my sister um, so 
We live with her, she's still saying I'm struggling, she's telling me I'm depressed. She hooks me up with a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist doesn't take insurance. <laughs> um, anyway, so each appointment uh, was 5,000 Kenya shillings and that's just seeing them. Even though I've seen you next week and I need an exact change in my medication, you want me to pop up 5,000 Kenya shillings just to see you. I guess that's how it works. At least the medication I could pay with insurance, so he did have forms for insurance for that. I started taking antidepressants. I'm put on anxiety medication. I'm put on... There was a month-long injection, Fluenzo. I think it's called Fluenzo. That one. I had... I'm forgetting the name. Benzixol. <laughs> I think that's usually for anxiety and also helps with the side effects. Um, and I'm also taking, I don't remember the other medication, the other antidepressants I was taking. So, and I was high all the time. Like, I used to do events and they feel like a dream. Like, I remember this time going with my sister to town. We went to Nairobi Textiles, got our measurements done, and it all felt like a dream like a total dream, like I would do things and then forget them, like I'm talking, I'm in the middle of a conversation and I forget what I was talking about and I've done an interview in that state, but I told them about my medication and they understood so they didn't hold it against me, um, I actually passed that interview and I've spoken to my manager like that. I remember him looking at me like, what's wrong with you? I think he thought I was high or something. I didn't explain. Or I would plan to be in a meeting and then sleep. <laughs> but the good thing is I could sleep. I had missed sleep. And for the first time in months, I could sleep. That was a big deal. So... Medication is expensive. The month ends and this doctor expects me to go get more medication, do more checkups, appointments with him. So this is costing me a lot of money and never like mm, that's not the right journal. You know, all this time, my first session with him, he left me feeling so shitty. He's like, Oh, you don't love yourself, you need to love yourself and I'm like, gee, thanks. Like, I left feeling really bad. He actually sort of insulted me in a sense. There's a thing, I would have to go through the details of what happened, but I don't want to do that. So, I go home with medication, but emotionally, I'm in a bad place still. Um, but I accept it as my fit and move on. So I start taking medication, flash forward the month ends. And the medication ends um, and the suicidal thoughts come again um, this time the difference was I was sleeping a lot so I'd come from not sleeping at all to now sleeping all the time I think I just didn't want to exist I would hide myself like someone would come to hang out with me and I'm like nope I'm not going anywhere. I don't want people to see me. If they knew who I was, they would stone me. That time, like, my mind has made everything so monstrous. That time, my mind has made everything big. A monstrosity. <laughs> um, so, I'll just stay in bed, watch, sleep watch sleep so my sister noticed that again and she told me tomorrow when i come and find you sleeping i'm going to wake you up and i'm like no i'm good now i'm sleeping before i wasn't sleeping now i'm sleeping i'm okay mm -hmm. depression <laughs> depression um so yeah that was my routine I don't consider that place I stayed with my sister my home at all. It used to be the place I went to sleep. That's what it was. Um, I don't consider it home. Like, I never considered it home. So, this time I talked to someone else and they recommend a mental hospital. 
so I go again. This time at least I'm like, I'll use insurance. All that expensive. So, happy. I go and I think it was a Saturday. So, because it was a Saturday, psychiatrists were not around. Um, so, they recommend admission. And I'm like, okay. And in my mind, if I'm admitted, I'll see a psychiatrist. And I just wanted to see a psychiatrist. And every time, oh, I've remembered. Oh. By the time I went to see the first psychiatrist, I had a death date. Um, it was somewhere in November. I was just trying to get out of probation at work. I don't know why out of probation was a marker for me, but I just needed to finish the three months. And I was also saving a lot of money specifically for my sister. And I wanted to leave her with enough money. So my plan was to transfer my money to her without her questioning it <laughs> so that I leave her sorted. So, yeah, because I had a death date, that's why I saw my first psychiatrist. After that, again, like I said, the suicide results came back full force. And the reason I now went to a mental hospital this time was because when, so my workplace had many flaws and I remember going flush, like let's flash back a bit. <laughs> I remember going to the top floor completely to access the rooftop so that I can see if it's jumpable and I find it was locked. So I'm like, okay, that method is not available to me. And I had done a lot of research. This is going to be dark. I had researched on pills, which type of pills you need, um, who, how many, and not just that. So the problem with pills is sometimes they just ruin your systems. You're destroying your kidneys, you're destroying your you basically will become a cabbage if the unaliving doesn't work. I don't know why I'm doing quotes on that when the unaliving doesn't work and guns are too gory plus guns are expensive plus getting a gun is work. Um, <laughs> I planned it all out. Um, hanging is also hard. Like you, you, you realize quickly how much hard it is to take your own life. Um, I even like way before I'd moved in with my sister. Like I, it had gotten so bad. I remember one night wanting to walk outside. Just if I, if I get raped, if anything happens to me, I don't care. Like hopefully you kill me after. Like that's how much I hated my life. Like, that's how bad it had gotten. And I'm not minimizing rape um, at all. So I hope that's not what, I'm, what comes out of this. But yeah, I had, it had gotten so bad. Um, so back to the workplace. Uh, so this time I think we have a fire drill or something. I don't know if it was a fire drill. Oh no, it was a work party. And then all of a sudden I look out the window and I'm like, but I have access through the windows. There's windows. And I used to tell this person all these things and I don't know if they didn't take me seriously or they thought I was just saying things. But yeah, they didn't take me seriously. The only time they thought I was seriously suicidal was when they took me to hospital. They told me this themselves. Um, so, <laughs> I realized I could jump through the window. So, I had this thing of researching about this every time, every time. And it gave me comfort. Not in a, it made me feel better, but it occupied me. It just felt like I could always end this. 
I could always end this suffering because it was suffering. I have never struggled to be with myself, but for the first time I struggled. I remember one time when I was living at my sister's, waking up, you know, it was a Saturday, getting out of the house. I'm not religious. I stand up, get out, go. I just wanted a church because there's a promise of peace in church. Um, so I go to an SDA church and see the whole time I'm like this. Um, I tried to participate in Bible study, like they tried to include me. This lady tried to include me and they want me to write my name at some point and I was hesitant and I tried to find peace there. There was no peace. So I'm like, no, I'm going to find this peace on my own. So I go back. I was watching Firefly Line, I remember. And I would take breaks to just feel bad. <laughs> you know? Because it couldn't take me completely. Um. Anyway, that was a church. I was just... So yeah, I discovered I could jump. And, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. I discovered the staircase. And like there's another staircase at the back and that one also has windows. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> um, I go home. I don't do anything that day. I don't even go to check the floors or something. I just go home with a possible plan. So I remember starting to now mourn my loved ones because I was leaving them. So I even decided I'm going to spend my last day um, and actually spend my last day with someone but I never tell them about it. I told them later uh, but I never tell them about it when I was, when it was happening. So because of that fear I decided let me get admitted. So I go check myself in and I somehow thought every solution I would take I would tell myself yay. I'm going to be fixed. I'm going to be fixed because I was so longing for normalcy and it wasn't coming. So, anyway, I go to hospital, nothing changes, and now you're left with your world. The whole of Sunday, nothing is happening because there are no psychiatrists, there are no psychologists. It's a Sunday. Um, and I've not told my workplace I'm at the hospital. I was using my own private insurance at this point, so they didn't get to learn about it. I don't tell them. Um, I try to shield them from it. So I continue working. I continue doing my research because I was addicted to it, like me, and Suicide Watch. There was Suicide Watch. There was, yo, I knew all the corners to find what I wanted to find and yeah every time I would feel sad I would just go there and think about my plan and feel like soon it will be over but also know how hard that is Monday comes I'm still really struggling I had a roommate who was really really depressed like way more than me they were doing ECT on her so they tried normal medication it wasn't working that brought her to hospital because she had attempted suicide. So I think she had attempted three times. One, she tried jumping on the road. Two. Yeah, I'm not sure I should be sharing such details here. Yeah. <laughs> but she basically tried to run herself through with, us, with scissors. Um, I think twice. That's when they brought her, they, I, like, I like her, I, would, I brought myself for her, she was brought because she was caught attempting suicide. Um, why am I bringing her up? Um, so anyway, let me continue. Monday I work and then I ask for sick leave, for leave out. You had to ask for leave out to leave the hospital. So I asked for leave out and go to so that I can go to work because again I had to show up physically on Tuesday and I've not told them I'm in hospital 
up until this point. I even had an interview I was doing on someone that day. So I go to work. Before going to work, I passed by one person's place and hung out with them. And they didn't know this, but this was me saying goodbye. They make me eggs. And anyway, this was me saying goodbye. Then I go to work. And I get to work. I go now straight to 15th floor because I've not been let out. I was in prison. My first admission I used to associate the mental hospital with an engagement. Um, because I remember the next day I was already telling them, can I be discharged, please? And they're like, you've not even seen a psychiatrist. And I'm like, yeah, let me see one then. It's the weekend. Uh, <laughs> and then I was already telling them how I want to volunteer. I need to give myself to charity. And I felt if I did that, then I would be absorbed of the badness that I was, of the bad that I had done, of the evil that I was. That meant giving my whole life completely to that. I think nurses are used to that. <laughs> they engage you. They even tell me, I'll tell you when there's something. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I text so many people about volunteer programs. Some respond. I was planning to literally quit my job, go give myself for life to charity for free uh, as long as you pay for my accommodation and food it's good i don't need to make money yeah i finally have a day out so day of execution um so yeah i get to office i go straight to 15th floor and i'm trying not to look suspicious you know so i just hang by the window there's cameras by the way on every floor staircase but I don't think someone monitors them because they should have not let me stay there. But I looked casual, it looked like I was just viewing the city. And there I was just fantasizing about the dive to freedom. Um, and I go back to work. I work. Um, I had an interview that day and I remember noticing how I envied the zeal this person had in life for life, the projects he wanted to keep doing, what you know, and I'm like, I miss that feeling. I don't have that feeling. Uh there was also a work dinner that day and people were chatting, smiling and, and I, I couldn't like um I just wanted to feel that too, you know. I wasn't going to it because I had to go back to hospital by 6 p.m. <laughs> you know, I was given permission. And they actually tell my manager I'm in a mental hospital. And I tell them I have an anxiety, because I, I had an anxiety attack that day. Um, I tell them that, don't worry, I'll have a pretext to all this late help explaining how I got here in the first place. For now, let me just focus on the depression part of it. So I tell him, he tells me to tell the HR. I'm like, no, don't. I'll tell them later. And they, he was suggesting I notify them so that I take a sick leave or something, a rest. So anyway, I don't. Because I want to continue working. Um, that evening, I remember that evening very, very, very much because it was officially the day. My second or first official attempt, I remember, bear in mind there's cameras everywhere, so I remember going to the 12th floor and I'm avoiding the camera, the camera is doing the stairs. So if I sat on the staircase, I would be seen, and I don't want to be seen. And I'm doing a lot of questionable habits, like using the lift, accessing it from the back. Like if someone was observing me, they would have noticed something was weird with this woman. Anyway, so I sit on the 12th floor, 
The reason I couldn't go to the 15th floor was the handle was they had put a sign do not open this door unless there's emergencies so I don't want to raise any concern any attention to draw any attention to myself so I go sit on the 12th floor there's a partition between the offices and the staircase where it's access to the toilets so I sit somewhere there and I sit there for 30 minutes, a guard comes and checks on me, they're like, someone noticed you and they asked me to check on you. I was like, no, I just like the quiet, <laughs> I just like the quiet, um, so I'm just chilling and they let me be, so they leave me alone. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't have, <laughs> they shouldn't have because the next building someone had committed suicide by jumping so yeah they really shouldn't have left me there <laughs> especially it was after hours i'm left there all this time i'm sitting i'm waiting to master courage to jump so that i leave the 12th floor and run up the stairs to 15th floor and jump that was my plan and i sat and sat and sat and i couldn't stand no, like I couldn't move. And I'm like, what's wrong with me? So back to my roommate. I remember wishing I had a conviction because, sorry to say, if she was in the same position, she would have jumped. Because <sighs> for her, she was just like, let's do it. She was at that stage. I was not yet there. Gladly never got there. Like, mine was still, I don't have enough courage. And I felt weak for it. Anyway, somehow I don't do anything. One hour, 30 minutes later, I leave the office. Like, I go back to the office and call a ride and go back to hospital. And move like nothing has happened. I make a mistake of telling this lady about it because remember I found a lot of comfort in discussing suicide and this is someone who had experience. So I felt like, hmm, relatable. Yeah, that was a really huge mistake. Because the next morning she woke up with an episode and came to my bed and was like, take me. Take me to your office so I can jump. And I'm like, that would be murder. <laughs> that would be murder. And they're like, no. Like this woman had even told the doctors, I think the anesthesia, the anesthesia person, or just, uh, to not wake them up. To just leave them sleeping for life and they're like no you can't do that then back to them anyway that was the part about my roommate the next day i'm overwhelmed and i end up telling my workplace about it like my the the hospital sent them an email and i relaxed for three days because i relaxed in that i no longer worked that's what i mean when i say I relaxed and I couldn't wait to be discharged. But at the same time, I didn't want to go back home. Remember, I've associated home with depression and just sadness. Not that I'm happy where I'm at. I'm still depressed. But I was doing anything to not go back to that house. I hated that house. My sister thought it's because I had downgraded, but that wasn't it. I just hated that house. So, um, yeah, um, the days end and I had to travel to Tanzania. So I go back, travel to Tanzania. That morning before traveling, I think my bus was at five or four, five, and my sister is waking me up and I don't want to wake up. At the same time, I also know sleeping is a mistake because I know it's still darkness 
my sister literally pushed me to wake up, pushed me to shower. I didn't want to shower. <laughs> she pushed me to pack the previous night because I decided, no worry, I just wrote things in together tomorrow. She was like, no. She helped me pack. And like, that's how bad depression can get. Anyway, so I ended up going to Tanzania and my journey was actually good. For the 16 hours, I was peaceful. I get them. Don't no worry, I'm still depressed. But yeah, my aunt is a pastor, so I'm exposed to church a lot in that period. And I liked that there was a promise of peace, there was a promise of a door over in life. But it didn't work the way I wanted it to work. I wanted it to be like, come to Jesus, and all your problems will be taken away. My problems weren't taken away. I still needed to do the same work I needed to do, religion or not. Not that I had a problem with work, is that it wasn't working for me. And even the same way it wasn't working, like pulling yourself out of a dark place is the greatest battle you'll ever have to do. Like right now I feel like a lot is ahead of me, but at the same time I'm like, I have fought, I have fought the battle of my life. There's nothing I can do. I can there's nothing I can do if I go myself out of there. This is me motivating myself in the middle of <laughs> my story. <laughs> you know? Go Sharon, go away there. So anyway, I did get peace. I still get anxiety like I'm just singing in church and then Paralyzing, like you're just stuck there, and I'm like, okay, let it pass. And it passes, and I feel really bad. I move on to what I was doing, and then another one, and another one, and another one. I won't go to war into what my family said about it. One even said, I thought I was a really good person, and nowadays she's really bad. It's just that she's related to me. She didn't say that to my face. <laughs> but I learned about it anyway. While I was being reprimanded. Is that the right word? Anyway, let me not go into details of people when it comes to that. It's not worth it. The good thing is my aunt really, really was there. Like, in her capacity as a pastor, she's also a counselor. So she really, really helped me and promised me that everything would be okay. And not because you'd come to Jesus, but because you'll forgive yourself. Because I was struggling with forgiving myself. Um. Anyway, because of that piece, this was this part is really important to the story because of that peace I felt I was able to now start reflecting and while I was in hospital the first time um, like the previous the one I just came from before coming to Tanzania um, the doctor had asked me no someone doesn't miss their life the way you did what was happening tell us what was happening that's not a normal mind like, do you have dreams of this? Are you a perfectionist? Like, they're trying to dig into what happened. And they want me to explain. And I had this corner in my mind of things I never told people because I was so ashamed. I decided it was too ashamed that I believed the things I believed in the first place. So I didn't tell anyone. And I didn't tell the doctors who could have helped me. Um... So, my memory starts, like I start feeling all these emotions for the first time and I start researching on psychosis and I dismissed psychosis all this time because I thought only people with schizophrenia get it and I had no reason to have had it so I didn't assume it was psychosis at all and no one around me suspected it. 
So this time I learned you can get psychosis from anxiety, from stress, from bipolar disorder, from drug overdose, like too much drugs, like drug induced psychosis. It's not specifically drug. You can even get it from alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you learn about all this. I listen to people's stories on the experiences of psychosis and I'm like, you're laughing about that? I can't. I'm not there. I ended up being able to talk about it on my TikTok actually. Way later. <laughs> But yeah, it made me feel like, oh, you thought someone was communicated, communicating to you through song lyrics? I thought I could communicate to them telepathically. I mean, it didn't matter that we didn't talk. We could speak. It was in the mind. I could put my hands on my chest and communicate to this person. Mm -hmm. At 28. At 27, at 28. So it goes to tell you it's not nothing about, even children don't do that. It was all a mental illness. Um, anyway, so I'm able for the first time to start understanding what happened to me and also start sort of forgiving myself. But then when I, it's time for me to go back to Nairobi, I remember that day before I came back, it was so bad. Um, I really struggled. It was so bad for me. Like, I remember my uncle, my aunt, like people noticing and telling me, you're back to feeling bad again. Like, you've just changed. Because I was going back to my reality. Work. Like, don't get me wrong, work wasn't what was stressing me. It was actually very stable for me. <laughs> so I go back. And I go back to, like I didn't even quit medication, but I go back to feeling really, really bad again. So I start seeing a therapist. I did some unstable things surrounding work at that period. Mm -hmm. It's been a weird year for me when it came to work. Um, I also go home. No. I was told to go home, like at work, to work from home, and I didn't like staying in my house, so I went to my parents' home, and they wanted a doctor to send them a letter indicating that I'm ready to go back to work. That's when I see a doctor, again, my doctor, and they give me new medication and make me promise not to quit it this time. And a few days later, I think it was really bad, like, I got in, like, the problem with the antidepressants is they don't kick in immediately, and it's like these doctors didn't take my depression seriously. They didn't think it was as bad because they kept giving me very low doses, too. Again, they also need to test things out and understand how bad it is before committing to higher medication, so I don't totally blame them. But they keep giving me very low, low doses and it wasn't working. So I go back, I get admitted, and around that session, that's when I start telling her about psychosis. And she's like, keep researching. I want you to come and tell me more. Because the problem with mental health is it's not something sometimes you can test it's something you see from people's behavior, from what they say, from, you know, from the messes they've gotten themselves into. Like indicators of money are <laughs> running yourself broken. <laughs> Sadly. Um, so yeah, of course there's test, there's lab tests you can do, but it's not all indicated on your lab tests most of it is not so the lab tests are just to check the hormone levels i think uh to see if that's what in, that's what is impacting your depression or whatever um so 
she tells me to research more and then the next session I end up talking about my experiences this time more openly and they're like yeah that was you were not in your right state of mind you were sick that wasn't normal so they put me on antipsychotics and I remember the relief I felt that day for the first time I had been validated that you were sick it felt like I was so happy uh, and now I start taking both antidepressants and antipsychotics um, yeah I was sleeping a lot like the, the, that drug is called olanzapine. It made me sleep and have high happy. I like you have high appetite. So I really ballooned up over the cast over this year because of the medication I was taking. Like I gained a lot of weight. I'm in my sixties now, <laughs> and it just. It's it's a struggle to get the weight back down, but that's okay. I'm patient with myself when it comes to that. Like, I have bigger battles to fight than looking a certain way for the sake of looking aesthetically pleasing to other people. Like, for now, the focus is just be okay housing yourself in the first place instead of having the ideal body, but you don't want to house yourself in the first place. So, yeah, I'm put on a lanzapine, and I think I only started feeling the effect of the antipsychotics months later, before I used to feel like, okay, I'm not actively in psychosis, so why am I taking these drugs anyway? But they were like, no, it's to correct your brain. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so I kept taking it, I kept taking them, and... Then I stayed for three weeks in hospital and after that I go back to work, very very psyched and I also had this plan of never needing to stay in the house because I associated till this day. I think right now I'm, I'm, I, I would live alone but for a long time I didn't want to live alone. Like I would fear, like I used to live with my sister but I'm mostly alone in the house because she's working. My work ends earlier, she goes for her work earlier. On the weekends she's working so I would be in the house alone a lot and I didn't like that idea. So luckily like I had bought boots, hiking boots. So I start hiking every weekend, sometimes even twice. Uh, yeah, there's a trip to Mombasa. Like, I remember getting out of the hospital. That weekend I went to Mombasa. The next weekend I went to Malindi. The next weekend, <laughs> like, hike, hike, do this. Just activities, fill your weekends. So my money, like, I had a budget out of my salary for such activities every weekend. Um, I didn't go out. Um, that's for one. I lost so many of my friendships, by the way. The ones that matter stayed, and the others faded, and I think I'm okay with that. I've had to lose friends before, but this time it wasn't something I mourned as much because I was already struggling with myself, so I didn't have capacity to take on other people's intolerance or impatience when it comes to me. Uh, I felt bad but then I moved on. Like most of my relationships ended up feeling like they were doing me a favor, like it was a pity on their end, them pitying me. It didn't hit me as much as it did before when I was in my rest state of mind. I do all this work, I'm really trying to get better. They even reduced my medication at this at some point and I'm excited, work is going okay. Um like everything was normal. What I don't remember what triggered me to get depressed again. Like, oh, of course, I was already continually depressed, but like to get suicidal again, and that's when they take me. They admit me again. This was the last admission for me. After that admission, I remember getting out, and I'm like, I'm never coming back here again. That was it for me. But I was also done with hospital. There was no 
feeling like I need no I was done um so yeah I get admitted for the last time I think there was issues at work or something I was struggling at work bear in mind like I've put I've been through a lot while working at my last company because of my mental issues and I had been admitted three, two times at this time three, uh, by the time I left three admissions three <laughs> three admissions um so that was difficult it was a difficult relationship for them i was not able to give them my all i was able to give them maybe 50 percent um so i didn't show up as myself i cut off my projects i couldn't do much of them because i really struggled so i don't blame that relationship ending up feeling scratchy with them because I just was really struggling, no fault of their own. Plus, it was the first time I was dealing with a mental illness, so I didn't know how to handle it. That ends. I leave that workplace after my last admission. My therapist was like, at least they let you um, do your healing, like do hospital. I continued working. This time again, I go to hospital, but I don't tell them. And I continued working normally, pushing a lot of work actually, um, but that didn't count. I think the relationship had really gone south with them, and that's okay. It's just life. Um, so yeah, I was let go, and. Weirdly, it was the best thing that could have happened to me because so when I was let go and I had someone who was supporting me financially, so I had my investments, don't get me wrong. And I had the option of continuing staying in that house, but I didn't want to. So what I did was run. <laughs> what I did was get on, I was planning to go stay at my aunt's place because again, the last time I was there, it only got bad when I went back to Nairobi and this time there's no need to go back to Nairobi I'm not stuck there because of work um, it was not a remote job it was a hybrid job so yeah I'm not stuck there because of work so my plan was to go to Tanzania and go shoot my content my, uh, my coding tutorials and do that for a while before even going back to applying for new interviews as I let my mind heal. I ended up coming to Uganda just out of the blue. I was to stay for a few days and I'm still here. <laughs> like I've left the country many times. I've even stayed home for almost a month. I have gone to South Africa. I've gone to Rwanda. I have moved a lot and that has been fun. But I can say this is my base at the moment and I was actually really anxious to come to Uganda but it's now good for me um, so that has been great I the whole point was just not not to live alone like I didn't imagine living alone at all uh, because that meant going deep into depression for me even when that wasn't the case I also had to tape off the medication because I'm no longer on insurance. I no longer have my job. So, luckily, the fact that I had this peace of mind now that I didn't have before and a healthy environment around me, I was I trusted that I could leave the medication and... Ooh! Right around my third admission, they had to change my antipsychotics because I had explained to them, I had expressed that I was gaining a lot of weight. And they put me on this one called Aripiprazo, Aripitas, and it used to make me restless. Like, I had all this energy and I had to do something about it now. Like, I couldn't sit still. So, for the first days after that, I was struggling like I would go to work and do gym a lot in the morning so that I use up a lot of that energy 
sometimes I'd have to take medication to just calm me down. Um, where you just feel high. <laughs> like, I'd started taking... Never mind. <laughs> but yeah, I used to feel high. So, yeah, I've been in a better place. Like, I have come a long way since June. The person who came to Uganda in June, and this person here in September, like, my family stopped even worrying about me. When I first came, my grandmother called me and like, why are you stressing us? <laughs> why are you stressing us? And now she's like, you're good. <laughs> yeah, she trusts that. She was even talking about it. She's like, when you were sick, and I'm like, I like that. <laughs> yeah, I'd really stress them when I was sick. So, I'm no longer sick, I'm no longer depressed, I'm not on medication, um, like, I'm not where I need to be in life, I feel like I've lost a year and more to that, to depression specifically, and people's lives just moved on, and some things I've learned out of this is I can't I don't have a definite way of getting yourself out of depression like I'll t try and tell you this and that like but one thing I know for sure is you can't shame yourself out of it you can't and that's an approach many people try to use with me like you should move on by now you should feel better by now you're still stuck and I'm like as long as you've never had to deal with that you have no idea and you really have no idea like to the point of this thing after my second admission I remember my mom telling me who oh, depression is real and I'm like you don't say because there's a time they had visited and she wanted to do things with me so that I'm excited about life and well, I just wanted to stay in bed. Like, you have visitors in the house. <laughs> but you have... Mm -mm. It's not that I don't want you in the house. It's just that I want to be in bed. <laughs> so, do your thing. Do everything. I'll be in bed sleeping. Which broke her heart, of course. But yeah, we're here now. She's no longer worried. Yeah, so I have so much to do, but I'm so grateful for this far, and I got myself out of that. I fought the fight, and I'm a survivor. <laughs> I'm a survivor. I remember the last time, no, I remember the last time I had self harm thoughts. Actually, a few months back, I remember telling myself, I'll never ever give someone that power over my life ever again. Um, that and like when you've been through depression, any any indicator that of darkness, like for instance, me wanting to right now, I don't fear when I want to just stay in bed and close the curtains. It doesn't start, spark in me uh, but yeah before any such indicators I've run as I feeling low and doing this a lot I'm like mm -mm, mm -mm. we can't get there we can't go back there it was really dark but yeah now I'm here and that's my story I figured I'll do a long form video instead of a short form one because the reality is many people don't understand how bad it gets, how bad it is fighting your own mind to stay here. They don't. And this is the reality of it. This is the reality of it. So I remember to be more empathetic, to be kinder, and we love a better world. Until next time, my name is Zaidera and he is to going further and further in life and achieving our wildest dreams.
I wish you all the best. Bye.